Righto, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to kick off with the next session. We've got Jackie Stroud talking, as you know, um, whose research is focused on making crops more productive by increasing the quality of the soil, a bit like we've been talking about already. And we have actually identified one of the main issues as being how difficult it is to actually find metrics that, that accurately give information about health of soil. Jackie, of course, is doing a lot of research at Rottenstead on worms, and we'll be talking about worms a lot. Worm populations being, of course, a strong indicator of soil health. Uh, and also, she took samples last year at Groundswell of 50 or so of you produced samples of your soil for her to do analysis on, and she'll be giving some feedback about that at this session too. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome Jackie Stroud. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today and be able to share with you some of my soil research that I've been doing over the past few years as part of my fellowship. I'm based at Rothamsted Research and I'm one of the first person to ever win a NERC fellowship to, to be there, which is quite exciting since it's an Environmental Research Council fellowship. And I think it's important to both do fundamental research, but also that my research has uh, application, that it has impact and it is useful. And certainly I had a workshop recently and I asked people, you know, what do you want to know about soil health? You know, is it another definition? Is it the sort of science behind it? And the overwhelming majority of people said to me what they wanted was um, how to realise soil health in practice. That was really what, what the key message they wanted to come out from, from presentations. So that's really what I hope to talk about today. And to begin with, I will start with that age-old thing, how do we define soil health? Well, just a quick overview is that biological, chemical and physical properties are what make up uh, soil health, in most people's opinion. And before, it was very much focused on the chemical properties, but these days there's a real resurgence and interest in the biological and physical properties of the soil. Now, if you take quite a pragmatic approach, as I do to most things, um, it's the aim is to uh, detect improvements from soil management differences, changes, and policy decisions. And so a really logical starting point for that is then looking at how we've managed our soils in this country over a period of time to really understand what, what we have done to the soils and thus what sort of parameters we can measure um, that would lead to changes. So just looking at historically, in terms of tillage practices in this country, for a very long period of time, uh, ploughing the soils has dominated cereal crop establishment. Minimum tillage has come into increasing usage and direct drilling has started to see a resurgence in application since it, um, since it used to be used in the 1970s. So there is a change in soil management practices, certainly reducing tillage intensity in this country. And part, you know, a lot of the reasons is, is to reduce the costs um, of crop establishment rather than soil health. But soil health is an interesting artifact. People often report changes in soil health having followed um, these changes. So if you look at the literature, the scientific literature, what happens if you change uh, soil management practices to reduce tillage intensity? And I looked at things, things that I thought were really consistent in the literature that people all agree on, and there are three things. The surface soil organic concentrations change. You'll see a change in aggregate stability in terms of the physical parameters, and biological, you'll see changes in the earthworm communities. So that's really what I base my fellowship on, measuring around this country with people and on my field trials to really look at this in some more detail. So when I say aggregate stability, this is um, an example here of some nice aggregates in water. See, they're holding their shape. And this is some aggregates here which are dispersed. They have poor, unstable aggregation. And this is a picture after a rainfall simulator of a poorly aggregating soil. You can see we've got puddling here. And so that's a little slate. And this can uh, lead to crusting and problems with emergence over time. And this is a paper I wrote on this recently about aggregate stability assessments across Rothamsted. In terms of surface organic carbon, the challenges with soil organic carbon is there's no minimum threshold for soil functions. There's been a lot of research into this to try and give people a threshold number to aim for. And there is a challenge um, in doing that. But I thought I'd show you some pictures. Um, this is from Broad Book. This has been ploughed for 175 years. We had our anniversary weekend on Saturday, Sunday, this weekend. And just here is the grass field, uh, the grass top end that's never been disturbed. You can see it's a much darker colour. And then over here is a sample from the uh, cultivated, it's been cultivated for 175 years, no straw return, 
and that's the colour of that soil. And if you went out there and you measured the soil carbon, I just want to take a second to show you this graph. This is the clay content of raw bulk along the bottom, so it's very variable. It will vary by 50%. Um, and these are all the mineral-only applications. This line is showing the theoretical minimum of soil carbon in that soil. And this is the theoretical maximum of soil carbon in that soil. And the area in between is called the manageable range. And that's really where scientists are getting quite excited about encouraging people to build soil carbon. Because if they can take the soil from here and go up to here, I believe a number of benefits can happen. For example, carbon sequestration and um, climate change, those sides of things. And uh, just to show uh, this graph here, this is most soil analyses are done to the top 23 centimetres of the soil. And uh, I do a lot of analyses in the surface part, of the top five centimetres, and we get a really nice correlation between the two because it's so well mixed because of all the, the ploughing that goes on there. And finally, earthworms. This is really my passionate subject. I will share the second half of my talk. But as you can see, this is walking around after ploughing various field trials at Rothamsted. And certainly there are quite a few casualties. And it's very well known for at least 30 or 40 years that by ploughing the soil, you do change the earthworm community structure. And there are two ecological groups that are affected. And it's the litter-feeding earthworms, the deep burrowers, and the surface-feeding epigeic earthworms. So in terms of measurements, this is why I focused on surface soil organic carbon, aggregate stability, and earthworm communities. Now, just to sort of share the pattern of my research, I often started a really well-characterized field trial, a scientific experiment like Broadbook. So 175 years it's been running, 175 years archived soil samples, weather data. It's very well understood. So it's a good place to start as a scientist. Then from sort of feedback and, and uh, outcomes from that, you can then look at specific field trials. So then I went around to different field trials, again, really well, uh, really well characterized to look at the uh, differences in soil health on those. But field trials are quite small plots. When I stand there in my field experiment and I have a nine meter by four meter plot, it's quite easy to come up with methods to measure that. But then when I went out to the, the real world, standing in real, real fields, particularly the 35 hectare field I sampled recently, translating that plot scale analysis to big scale was a real, um, took me a few years to get, get the hang of that, to be honest. Um, I've then had the fortunate opportunities to work with the AHDB monitor farms, uh, which Earthworms and soil health are just one part of the picture, and it helps sort of put that in a, a bigger picture. And the idea of these monitoring strategic farms isn't that they're demonstrations, you just sort of go there and have a nice day out. It's that you can take home key messages from that. So I've been trying to support and also encourage people to go and measure their soil health and then help with the interpretations of that. So that's how I'll be talking about it today. And last year I had an initiative where I encouraged people to bring you some soil samples, so hopefully some of you did. And I ran about 50 soil samples in the end, and I was measuring aggregate stability and soil carbon and some other things. And then this year I launched an initiative called 60 Minute Worms, so I was encouraging people to spend 60 minutes in their fields to measure earthworm populations. And I wanted to try and help and encourage um, measuring soil health doing that. So aggregate stability, just a second to go over the definition. It's the ability of aggregates to resist disintegration when disruptive forces associated with tillage and water or wind erosion are applied. The measurement is measuring the mean weight diameter of the soil, and it tends to work for silty loam soils, so it's really not a good test for sandy soils. Uh, it, the impact of aggregate stability is it affects water movement storage, aeration, erosion susceptibility, nutrient leaching, and crop emergence, and it's impacted principally by tillage. So, at Rothamsted, we have a number of long-term field trials, <laughs> and hopefully this will play, but it doesn't play. Never mind. Um, so that would just be showing the disintegration um, of aggregates when you place them in water. But moving on, uh, at Broad Book is where I started the survey. Now Broad Book is shown here, it's a large field trial, and it has intensive cultivations. Each and every year it's ploughed, and then power harrowed, and then uh, drilled with a horse seed drill. It has five yard manure on the selected plots down the side for 175 years, and people say to me, you know, well people say it has sustainable yields, because year on year we see improvements in, in yield over time. And just on the side here are all the different treatments and conditions. So I went round and I measured the aggregate stability on each and every one of those plots um, in the continuous wheat cultivations. And what the results showed, and not unsurprisingly, is they have poor aggregation. They're very unstable soils on broad bulk. And that's not unexpected. It's cultivated intensively. There's no organic matter return going on most of the field. So this is what one would expect. 
Uh, so the next field trial was very much looking at trying to improve soil health. So this is a neighbouring field called Foster's, and uh, it was a very large field experiment where different types of organic matter were being ploughed into the soil, so that's biomilk and your anaerobic digestate, straw or compost, in order to measure benefits in, in soil health. And uh, Jack over on the program stand has an excellent slide on this if you want to find out in more detail about these experiments. And um, what we found is that there was a significant yield increase by adding the organic amendment back in. But through all the measurements that we made, chemical or physical or biological, we couldn't find any conclusive evidence to explain why there was a yield increase. And so the, the professor, his conclusion was, despite the lack of evidence, um, we believe that soil organisms have improved the structure, which is enabling the plants to grow better. And I measured the aggregate stability on that experiment, and unfortunately we didn't see a change in that over time. So over four years, despite these different organic amendments versus the untreated, the soil stayed very unstable. And it's been cultivated for about 100 years. Again, no organic matter um, has gone in, and it's been in arable production. And just to say, that field is definitely capable of aggregating, because if you go to the grassy edge, it's uh, very high levels of uh, aggregation. And the tram line, which we're using in sort of worst case scenario, um, has similar levels to that of the plots where we've been treating and feeding the soil biology with the organic matter, so not finding any differences in aggregate stability. <coughs> so this gave us an idea, and I had a student who came, and she really wanted to get on board and start working with farmers. And so we thought, well, why don't we do this test? If you test the grass as your best case scenario, look at the levels of soil carbon, the aggregate stability on that. The crop, that's the management sort of scenario, like well, how good management practices are. And then the tram line, we're using that as the worst case scenario, because certainly sometimes the areas that are kept bare without plants and, and um, regularly rolled over. So that's what we did. So how do you go out and you find farmers? Because we work at a, you know, science, scientists aren't exactly trained how to do this, but at Rothamsted we're lucky to have uh, Rothamsted Farmers Association, and I had a few email addresses. So I emailed a few people, and I was very pleased with the response. People were like, yeah, you can come on, I'll come on board. And some people offered us cups of tea and breakfast, and other people just gave us the gate code and said, help yourself to whatever field you like. So we had different sort of interaction levels. It was all good, though. And uh, it, we were spending quite a short time in each field. We wanted a quick sampling method, so we just spent 15 minutes. We knew we could do about 60 samples per week. My student was with me for only six weeks. She was traveling from America, so she was... Uh, we kept our numbers down, and we wanted to give feedback quite quickly. So we were aiming to get everything back within the month, so we put a high throughput here. So here we were, going out and sampling. We just took a small surface soil sample to do the aggregate stability. We came and visited Groundswell, and we took some samples from the herbal lays, and uh, we went around with lots of local farmers who kindly let us loose on their fields. And we were able to sample many different management practices. Local to us people, we were a whole range of different management practices, organic matter amendments, different types of farming. So it was quite useful. And we thought about how we returned the results. So what we did was we sent people a report with their findings, the science behind it. And we were showing our sort of, your grass area was generally higher and the field was generally lower. But that's the sort of management range. And the feedback we got from that, well, I sent all those emails back and I heard nothing back. And it's hard for me to really say whether it was a good idea or a bad idea. This, was, this is what we did. The results were very similar to what we'd seen before. It was in agreement with bigger surveys we'd done, which were just entirely done by scientists. But it was, it, I didn't really feel that feedback was there. People let us out onto their fields. Um, I sent the results, but, uh, but that was really that, the way that ended. I realized with our data set, we had only had six zero tillers take part, so our data set was quite unbalanced. And the opportunity came up to come to Groundswell, so I asked if we could encourage people to bring me soil samples. And I was really pleased with the response, because it was quite last minute. You see, I got a whole range of samples and a whole range of you know, jars to tubs, to, to butter dishes, even a whole bucket full of soil was brought to me. And, um, and we dried them out in our labs, and we ordered them quite neatly. And I measured wet aggregate stability, uh, soil carbon. And then we were trying some other things, like fungal hyphae, glomerulin-related soil protein, and extractable carbon. And we were measuring these things. We measured the hyphae, because it's always mentioned in the literature, and I hear a lot about that. We were measuring glomerulin-related soil protein, because we had a, um, one of the world experts at Rothamsted who works on those biological aggregating agents, and uh, he had a great test for doing that, and extractable carbon. And so here were the results. Most of the samples we were given were in the stable range. I plotted it against soil organic carbon and aggregate stability here for interest. And some samples were in the medium, so they kind of aggregate. But most of our samples were in the stable zone, which was quite pleasing. 
And just to put that in a bigger context with the bigger survey we did, so we had a, a larger DEFRA funded survey a few years previously, where we'd seen really good relationships between aggregate stability and soil carbon. Then this was mine and Yip's survey, where we went round for our paired sampling, we got really good correlation to Groundswell, we got very similar to our DEFRA survey. And broad book down here at the bottom, you can see the 175 years of continual cultivation sits very much in this unstable zone. So it was very nice to see this whole range of soil um, aggregate stabilities across the country. <coughs> and if we just put that, this is just from the DEFRA data set that we collected, and as I said, I didn't have many zero soils take part. But what we found from our initial survey was that half the ploughed soils, or people who said they were cultivating regularly, their soils were unstable. So there are people who could potentially benefit by changing soil management practices to deliver those benefits. And the ways to do that based on the survey are to look more at zero tillage or, or grass, um, because every sample we collected from those situations was very stable. And as, as probably, uh, not unexpectedly, the horticultural so soils we analysed, which are very intensively cultivated usually, were quite unstable. Um, in terms of the other measurements we made, we looked at high fee and glomalin and extractable carbon, but we were really struggling to find good, strong trends across our data sets. So, I, uh, so it was just some pilot study data there, but as you can see, we didn't get any strong or powerful relationships, which is a shame. So, to improve uh, our good stability, it's just straightforward things, reducing tillage intensity and uh, frequency, careful timing of, of cultivations, and a good diversity of rotations. Now, moving on to earthworms, which, as I've mentioned before, is one of my most favourite subjects. And, uh, again, I followed a very similar style of doing things. We started, I started on broad book, so I can show you the data from broad book in terms of the worm populations across this field trial. Um, then specific field trials where we were trying to measure benefits of changing soil management practices in earthworm populations before moving into larger field trials around the country. And then I also wanted to really encourage people to put this um, to the test. So back to broad book again. Uh, nice trial. I did uh, all the continuous wheat strips for my assessments. And there's a team of four of us, and it took us a few days. <laughs> and as you can see, we have quite a lot of earthworms on broad book. So even though it's intensively cultivated, there's no organic matter really going in, and there are plots that have only received mineral fertilizer for 175 years, there are still earthworms across this field. Uh, 2.1 and 2.2 .2 are the ones that receive farmyard manure for 175 years, and the rest of these are mineral only fertilizers. And if we look at depleted levels, that would be less than 100 worms per meter squared. Only a few plots are depleted. Most are in the intermediate range, and a few hit the active range. But if you take the data a different step and you look at the biomass, and you start to see a slightly more interesting trends coming out there. So on the farm yard manure plots, there are much, so there's much greater biomass there. And that's because that's where all the deep burrowing earthworms live. They all seem to live in that strip of farm yard manure, and across the other side of the field, you tend just to find the small green worms, the green worm species. And that gave me an idea for looking at soil earthworm communities in a slightly different way. If you look at earthworm communities in terms of how many times when I dig a soil pit do I find at least one earthworm? Well, 88% of the time digging a soil pit on Broadbook, I would find at least one earthworm. If I then assessed how many times I found surface species of earthworms, surface adults, the answer was 0%. I didn't find a single surface litter dwelling earthworm on Broadbook. Um, the topsoil worms, well, 8 out of 10 soil pits would have those in. And 17% of the pits, I sometimes find the deep burrowing earthworms, and they were concentrated on the farmyard manure over there. And overall, the total population of worms on Broad Book was 1.32 million. And compared to the national survey we've just completed, the average overall from that was around 2.5 million. So in comparison, Broad Book does have lower populations than the majority of fields in this country. So, there was another experiment where we were trying to improve soil health by using organic amendments given these promising results. And as I mentioned before, there was a little um, evidence of this. But if I analyse the earthworm community structure, again, the number of surface feeding worms, they were absent. There were plenty of topsoil worms, very few deep burrowing worms. And the population numbers ranged between 2 million, went up to 6 million, and went back to 2 million again. And this is really when I started thinking about earthworm populations and earthworm numbers. So earthworm numbers is useful, but if you just take that extra step and look at your community structure, it can just tell you a little bit more about that environment because we know that soil management practices change community structure. So being able to take a little bit of extra time and knowing what you've got 
tell you a little bit more about the um, environment. And the question is, you know, do we need all the types of earthworms in our soils? If we don't have any surface feeding worms, what does it, you know, what impact can that have? The deep burrowing worms, the drainage worms, if they're very infrequent, is that a problem? And I'd argue it would be quite nice to have all the benefits of earthworms. We know they improve plant productivity. We know that their burrow network is quite unique at helping roots get to depth. And we also know they're a really important food source for wildlife, particularly those surface feeding worms, the ones that live in the litter layer. So I would argue that it's useful to have the whole community structure um, in our soils. And it's something that feedback we get from farmers all the time, this was kindly shared by Tom Sizemore from the University of Reading. And he asked people to rank uh, indicators for their usefulness, and earthworms came top. And if you went around cereals last week and you looked at the leaf stand, which uh, you can see the earthworm counts came out quite well, and there's another uh, leaf stand today over in the, the top corner of the field, and uh, worms were winning when I walked past that as well today. And I had a, a workshop, as I mentioned, a few weeks ago in May, and it wasn't just sort of asking, oh, do you find worms useful? I was like, what would you actually do with this information? Would you use this information to change your soil management practices? And people said yes, you know, and as a scientist, that means you have this huge responsibility to help understand what they mean, but also that the measurements are robust, and that's really where I saw my research could help. So, you know, when you sort of see for little signs of earthworms in the environment, you might notice middens on the soil surface, which are made by the deep burrowers. Or if you don't have these earthworms, what you'll see is just piles of straw that just doesn't really get broken down because you don't have those litter feeding worms. Do you have worm casts on the surface? That's something many people can spot. And then another thing people often say to me is, um, you know, that when they're ploughing, they, they've got loads of worms because there's loads of birds following them, so that's all good. So they used to have lots of worms, um, a lot of worms. But now, um, if they're seeing fewer number of birds following the plough, is there something wrong with their soils, or is it just the type of birds? So these sort of questions are coming up. And as scientists, we know that earthworms are ecosystem engineers. They play really important roles in crop productivity. They are important for water infiltration, crop rooting depth, um, bird food. They change aggregate carbon and nitrogen dynamics, the greenhouse gas supply. And even the very presence of earthworms in the soil environment changes the plant defensive chemistry and will increase susceptibility to aphids, but decrease susceptibility to chewing insects like, uh, like thrips. So the presence of earthworms really do change the, uh, the, the environment of the soils. And we are the number one ecosystem engineer, although earthworms can do all this, and that is through tillage. Now, although we know all of this, I have to say I'm somewhat disappointed when I look through the scientific literature for methods to measure earthworm, earthworms. And this is one of the most recent guides that came out. It's a big, it's a lovely big textbook about how can we uh, assess soil health through the sustainable intensification manual. And metric four, earthworms, the number of earthworms in a given quantity of soil is a rough indication of soil biological activity, tends to be positive for agriculture. And that was all I could find on earthworms in this sort of textbook. And that's a little frustrating. So I took it upon myself to try and answer the questions that I'm always asked when people say, do I have a good worm population? And I thought, well, there are three things I'd want to know. So that's what I set this test up to test. First of all, are the earthworms widespread? If you have a field and all your earthworms live in one corner of it, is that useful? Probably not. So want the worms to be widespread. Secondly, do we have the full suite of earthworm functions? Do we have the litter feeding bird food? Do we have the topsoil worms that mobilize nutrients for plants? Do we have the deep burrowers, the drainage worms? I think it's useful to know if we've got those worms in the environment. And finally, everyone always wants a threshold, a number. And in the literature, there was a nice meta-analysis done a while ago um, in 2014, where the question was, do earthworms improve plant productivity? And the answer was yes, they do. And when they looked at the numbers, if you have over 16 worms in a soil pit, which is a 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter cube of soil, that leads to significant benefits in plant productivity. So I thought, well, in terms of thresholds, why don't we go for that gold star, that A level? Let's go for the, um, the A grade. That over 400 per meter squared of worms, which 16 per spade wall, how many people can achieve that in their fields? So they were the three targets I set. And I set out this, uh, this guide. I wrote it myself, this 60-minute worms idea, uh, because on average it takes me 60 minutes to do a field. And I was very pleased it got picked up a little bit by Farmers Weekly, encouraging people to take part, the organic farmers. Um, I put something on Farmers Forum, and a few people took part from that. And in the end, I ended up posting out over 200 booklets to people. And then I wanted to encourage people to take part. And it was a very straightforward method. 
just needed five things, and uh, then to post me back the data, and I'd send a report. And the most common questions I was getting by email were sort of ones I wasn't particularly expecting. People wanted to know if there was a soil temperature that they should aim for before sampling. And the answer to that was, uh, was no, there wasn't really a temperature I was going to recommend. Um, it was just when you had time to do it, the time sampling period was between mid-March to the end of April. So it was a six-week window for measuring. The crop type required for the survey, well, I do work on cereal fields, so that was um, easy for me to understand and analyse. But I got a wonderful range of, uh, of crops and people taking part. And if it was suitable for children to participate was the third one. And it was great to see so many people going out there with their kids over Easter looking for earthworms and sort of taking part in soil health measurements. As a scientist, when you're doing your job every day, sometimes you don't appreciate there are challenges you never really um, had. For example, a key part of the method was identifying between adults and juvenile earthworms. And I didn't realise that was, um, was going to be a difficult... I just put a small sort of footnote in the method. So then I, thanks to the feedback from people going, oh, I had some challenges here, I was able to put some pictures on Twitter. I also made a YouTube demo just to try and help overcome some of the method challenges, which I hadn't appreciated when I wrote the... Um, and I wrote the guide. And it was very much a working together thing. I was able to call up Tim, and uh, he was very kind. He sort of came out and we did two of his fields, and just to get that one-to-one -one feedback as to which bits of the method he liked and which bits could be more clear, so we went and did that. But then just on Twitter, I noticed lots of people were, were happily taking part and showing their great enthusiasm for looking at their soil health and uh, the responses. I did want to make sure this method was robust. So there were some measurements that I made to help support this. So one of the first measurements is how many earthworms are missed? Because I was asking people just to spend five minutes sorting through their soils. And you're not going to get every single earthworm by doing that. So I wanted to know if that was going to influence the data. So I managed to get a number of volunteers, uh, a number of fields, and we got them sorting the soil, then leaving that soil for someone else to come and resort. And then all the worms they counted, we, uh, sorry, all the worms they found we then counted to, to determine the percentage error. And what we found was, yes, there were some worms missed. It was an average of two per pit. But they were all juvenile earthworms, so it means we're underestimating our numbers a little bit with this method. But in terms of the community structure, we are finding, generally we're finding all the right sorts of worms. So I feel that was quite a confident, I feel quite confident this method of working in that way. Um, the other thing, I was very lucky to work on the strategic farm, and we did samplings both in the autumn and in the spring. And I was looking at how well, how robust this method was. And it's, it doesn't really matter what the, the results are, but you can see that generally they all stayed in the red category um, for the surface worms. In the topsoil worms, it ranged a little bit more, but there were only uh, six out of nine fields where there was a different category. And the deep burrowers, generally they weren't very common, but in the fields where they were, a very, very sort of robust measurement. The community structure does tend to stay quite stable, whereas earthworm numbers does fluctuate quite a bit. So that gave me more confidence that this measurement can be done in the spring or autumn, the two best times of the year. You can be quite confident you'll see the same thing both times. Now, what I did this time was I spent... It took me a lot longer than I realised, but I wanted to do a nice report. I think each report took me about an hour, so it was a very uh, enthusiastic um, thing I put into this. And we had the, uh, the results as a um, bit like a food traffic light. And I tried to sort of give you an explanation and also the earlier results from an autumn-spring session I did. And something that people wanted and, and requested was a workshop to come to me and we'd all come together and we'd talk about the method and the results. So I was able to win some funding from my funders, the Soil Security Programme, to hold that. And it got enough interest that someone from DEFRA, AHDB and uh, BBSRC came along to see what we'd been up to. So that was very exciting. Now, who took part in this? Overall, I was hoping for 100 fields, and 139 fields took part. That was 87 people all over the country. So that was um, one person in Ireland, I think, one in Scotland, one in Wales, and everyone else from England. And it was a nice mixture. About a third were no-tillers or no-till fields. A third min-till. Min-till was anything that I couldn't put in the no-till or plough definition because it's quite hard to... There are many different tillage management strategies. And a few pasture farmers took part as well, or at least fields in permanent grass, um, which isn't an area of my expertise, but it was uh, good to see. And then um, the smallest field was two hectares, and the largest field was 80 hectares, which is twice the size I've ever tried to attempt. And the average size is 10.7 hectares. And there was a nice range of management practices taking part. People who were putting organic matter back in, people who put straw in, 
and different crop, crop types. And all these sorts of parameters affect worm presence and community structures. So um, a few things came out. Someone said uh, they were finding a problem uh, where they saw lots of middens, but they didn't find very many deep burrowing earthworms. So I went out to visit those fields and have a look, and it looked like we needed a small method modification. I had two fields at the end of the day that got 100% in every single one of my categories. And what that meant is if I went out there and I took a spade, I'd be pretty confident to find each ecological group, at least 16 worms, in, in that spadeful. So I was, uh, I was traveling through and I contacted the farmer who was very kindly let me out onto that field that he tested. And, uh, and indeed, the first two um, pits that we dug, we found all the ecological groups and over 16 worms. So I was quite confident this method was working nicely. And then there were some more negative results that were coming out. People who thought they had earthworms, you always just sort of assume you've got them. And when they went and actually looked, they found there weren't any. And sort of, could I go and check they did the method right? So I was passing through and I was able to stop by and we had a look. And indeed, we couldn't find very many earthworms in that field. And it was... Um, you know, and that just sort of opens the door for more questions, you know, going out there and retesting, looking at chemical assessments and trying to understand why and where the earthworms had gone. Um, and another field who felt he'd been building organic matter for 15 years and assumed he had a lot of worms. Well, when we went in that field, we only found about three, in, three worms in five soil pits. It was a really low number. And then we went into the neighbouring fields just to have a look. And there were plenty of worms there, so something had gone a bit wrong in that management of that field. But just by taking the time to look in the field and just see what you've got, suddenly um, it was a bit of an eye-opener for many people. So the overall average, well, it was quite a good news story, really. If you were to dig a pit in any field, I'd be quite confident in this country, nine out of ten times, you're going to see at least one earthworm. And then in terms of the earthworms that you have in that pit, around five, you know, about four to five times out of ten, you'll find adult surface worms, topsoil worms, or deep burrowing worms. So this is quite a nice story. High numbers of worms, how many people can get over 16 worms per spadeful? Well, the overall average, as I said, was about two and a half million worms per hectare. So it wasn't really that many fields that could achieve those super high numbers. Um, but there are little hot spots in most fields where you can have high numbers of worms. I did a little bit more analysis. This um, came through at five o'clock yesterday because we only had this data recently. And what we're looking for is clumping. And all I can say is there's no really consistent trends here. Uh, the, the no tillage is slightly clump, clumping in terms of numbers this end to the ploughing this end, but no till doesn't necessarily guarantee high worm numbers, it just tends to clump more in this area. Similar where straw is retained, it tends to clump more with higher worm numbers in this end. Um, other factors like adding organic matter, you see there's a whole arc, it's hard to say a really definitive answer here. And similarly the crop type, there's no definitive spacing, there's not sort of clumping in different areas, you can see the data is really rather scattered. And, uh, yeah, so all I really want to say about that is we all have such different management conditions. There's not sort of one size that fits all. But coming together and sharing those management practices and helping to see where key trends are is much more powerful and the way, uh, the way to move forward. The overall trend, if I put the averages in terms of tillage only in a very simplistic way, you see that no-till generally came out the best for worm populations. The average worm population was 3.8 million per hectare. And uh, there was a good presence of worms in all the ecological groups. Whereas under ploughed or more cultivated conditions, it was particularly those drainage worms that were more vulnerable um, to being found, sorry, to being absent or at least low numbers in a field. And to improve worm populations, particularly the deep burrowers, it's looking again at conventional tillage. It's making sure there's a food supply on the soil surface um, to help feed them. Nice diverse rotation, yeah, reducing tillage intensity and diversity. At the workshop, which I thoroughly, I've never held a workshop before, so it was quite daunting to stand up in front of a group of people and talk about a method you set up that they spent time on. Um, overall, it was quite a big success. Over 14,000 worms are actually counted on farms around this country this spring, which is over 1,000 hectares. So that's just a really nice um, little indicator of soil health that we have in this country. And I really wanted to know how people chose which field they sampled. Because if you chose your best field, that would show you one sort of interpretation. If you chose your worst field, then the data would mean something a little different. But almost a third of people who, who, um, who took part just chose the field that was closest to the barn, which is quite funny. So that was a good sampling thing. And we looked at um, compliance levels, whether people followed the method, how confident they were in the data. And there were some areas that came out, particularly earth from identification, and uh, was the key area that needed a bit more help and support. 
and confidence in others' data. I asked everyone, how confident are you in other people's data? Choice high, medium, or low. 100% of people I asked went medium. So we all sort of slightly trust each other, which is, uh, which is good. But generally, people were quite keen to do it again. So, workshop outcomes. So in the only 16% of the fields that were tested had the likely presence of all ecological groups. And 20% of the field showed a depleted number of earthworms. I think there's real room for improvement in worm populations, although everyone has potential. 100% um, of people wanted to do it again, so that's encouragement for me to support a, a worm survey again this autumn, so that's what I shall do. Moderately confident in data collection. People wanted a better, um, people wanted more support for doing that, and also the scheme to be more formal, so I set that up. And then finally, um, yeah, so that's it really. So there's going to be another new worm sampling set, uh, date between the 15th of September and the 30th of October, which I'll be able to support. Um, so if you want to send me your data again, I'm happy to, to see how that fits into the picture and um, just contact me for more details. Then the next thing was the leaflet. We have a new national leaflet for sampling earthworms. So based on all the feedback from farmers and through the pilot study, we now have a how to count earthworms leaflet and interpretation and recording sheet. So you don't necessarily have to contact me, just you can do this and see how you get on. Red is um, could do better, and amber and green are the ideal scenarios. So that's here and available to anyone. And finally, to try and help and solve the problems in earthworm identification, I've made a fun earthworm identification quiz sharing some of our key findings that we've had so far. So it just is lots of pictures from my lab or from field sampling where it's the right answers, um, well, it's sort of like pictures of worms, a selection of answers, and you can just go along and give it a go. And I'm afraid only, I'm not a computer whiz or anything, so it really just works on PCs and laptops, you know, a big screen, like it's not designed for phones or anything. But just have a go and just see if you can build your confidence up. And if you have any feedback, let me know. But I hope that will really support your knowledge of your worms um, in order to get the best sort of data and make the most of worm counting. And finally, I think it's really important to communicate this stuff to as wide an audience as I can. So I was lucky enough when I was over at the Leaf Open Farm Sunday to share my fun method with Mr. Go, and giant worm in the background. The worm is over on the stand in the black barn. If you'd like also to have your photo with it, feel free. Um, I often help with farm events and cereals last week. And BBC chap came and spoke to me the other week, so we were talking about uh, changes in soil health through measuring earthworms. And then finally, um, you know, through open weekends and inspiring the next generation, I'm very lucky to work with lots of school children who come around. And their interest in earthworms is pretty good, but also soil health and agriculture is very inspiring. So just to sort of summarise, in terms of measuring soil health, um, there's a range of soil. Soil organic carbon can often be correlated to many parameters. It's why people like to measure it, and there's often potential for improving it in many systems. In terms of aggregate stability, approximately 28% of the soils that I've tested in my national surveys to date are unstable, so that's the room for improvement there and something we could see benefits from. And then in terms of the earthworm communities, around 20% of the fields that took part in the survey did have indications of depleted populations. So again, it's a metric with potential for improvement. And that's it. So uh, I'd just like to thank you very much for your attention and for the wonderful people that I've had the fortunate thing to work with over time. There are leaflets available here and at the AHTB stand if you'd like to do more worm counting. And yeah, I hope, I hope you feel inspired to do it. And any questions, please let me know. That's it. Thank you. which is bringing together all the soil health, uh, sorry, all the earthworm research done and looking at that in terms of plant productivity. And what that showed is that all the, all the three ecological groups of earthworms, the epigeic, endogeic, and anisic, come together and are beneficial to plant productivity. And then looking at the numbers, it came through that. 
And then the idea behind just looking for the adult population is very much that you're reproducing population. So that's why just looking for the adults and then looking at that across the field gives you a bit of confidence that you have a reproducing population. And looking at historical data sets from Rothamsted where we have some fields without certain ecological groups um, is sort of interesting in that way because it's very consistent over time. We don't see big changes. So community structure is a very stable parameter. Okay. Yes? Hello. What, what, what is the typical lifespan of a worm and, uh, and when do they reproduce? What a great question. I love that question. So I'll talk about the most vulnerable earthworm, which is uh, Lumbricus terrestris, the deep burrowing earthworm. It can live for up to five years in captivity. Some earthworms can live for up to 10 years in captivity. Obviously, their average lifespan is slightly shorter because they're really important food sources for a number of things. The deep burrowing earthworm population, uh, so that, that sort of thing, it can make eight cocoons a year. From each cocoon, only one earthworm will hatch. That worm can take a year to mature. So it's a very long life cycle, and then it can start reproducing. But the interesting thing about the deep burrowing earthworm's reproduction is it never comes, it never leaves its burrow. It'll come out on the forage around the soil surface to find a mate, and then mate on the soil surface. So you often might need to be in quite close proximity in order to have successful mating periods. So they're very vulnerable to um, soil management practices because of their very slow reproduction rates. In comparison, so, you know, some litter feeding worms have much faster life cycles and uh, live, they live shorter, but they live, have faster reproduction. Can I ask you, from your research, uh, maybe you can say me something about uh, a chemical influence on the earthworms and sure, population. Yeah. Yep. So in arable situation, uh, which of the chemical types is most uh, concerned for them? Okay, um, sorry, in terms of the research, the number... Yeah. Uh, so the question was, could I uh, talk about the chemical effects on earthworms. So the number one thing that affects earthworm populations is tillage because it's damaging their habitat and uh, chopping them in half, exposing them to predators. It's redistrib redistributing the cocoons. So number one is always tillage. Number two is how much food supply there is. So if there's surface litter, it's really important for litter feeding earthworms. That's why cultivating and burying that litter supply is so detrimental to their populations. So that's number two. And then number three, chemical inputs do play a role. Um, but in terms of, uh, for example, the bigger the crop grows, so adding nitrogen to crops, particularly on places like Broadbrook, you see higher earthworm populations under those because the crops are growing better. So that's some of the beneficial effects of things like fertilizers on earthworm populations and chemical inputs. Okay. Hi. Right. I have two questions. Okay. There's, I think Opal have done quite a big <laughs> survey on earthworms, yeah. and I was wondering if you'd looked at any of their data mm -hmm. and if it was any good or interesting and if you'd incorporated that into your research or not. Okay. And then the other one was, I mean, I, look, I think quite a lot of farmers would do this, but I can't imagine everyone uh, categorizing them and count, um, you know, different species and stuff. Is it still a worthwhile exercise if you're just simply counting the amount of worms? as opposed to it's this X many of this type of worm and okay. that many of the other, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand the question. So like a a half-baked yeah. worm, worm count. So in terms of the opal survey, it's an excellent survey. It's looking at the, um, just to explain it, you dig a soil pit and then you look at the earthworms, but you take them down to species level. So you then know if you've got black-headed worms or lumpus terrestris or, you know, the blue-gray worm. And that's what it is. So it's a really useful survey from an ecological perspective. What I found is it doesn't really answer the questions that people have asked me about far, you know, in farming. It's sort of which ecological groups have I got. It doesn't really have that level of analysis. It's gone, it's more of a scientific question they're asking. So I've been liaising with them and I certainly encourage people to use the guides and contribute where possible. But it's really very much the stage after this. If you want that extra ecological level understanding, use the OPAL guide. And then in terms of just doing worm counts, I don't find that, that as useful, to be honest with you. The reason is, is the populations fluctuate so much year in year. And if you dig a soil pit here and you dig a soil pit here, you get a very different answer. So in a structured way, by doing 10 pits across a field, um, you can sort of take out some of that variability. And it's very much looking at the number of times you find the different groups in the pit. 
as opposed to a number-based thing. So it's more presence across the field. And that's where the power is. And it's a very, you know, it's a 15 question quiz just to get your eye in. There are only about eight common species of worms in our field. So it is something. I'm always impressed by all the wildflowers that farmers can name or the exotic bird species that visit. And there are just eight species of worms. So I reckon we can all do that too. But if we start at this, if we start at this level and do the ecological groups, we can then go further and, and look more into those details. So, yeah. Um, yes, one evening whilst killing slugs in the dark outside of my lawn and, yep. and snails, I see something under the edge of my flashlight moving. Mm -hmm. And it was a damp evening, so I moved my flashlight a lot quicker, and it yep. was worms. And they go so quick and yes. shoot underneath the ground. They do, yep. If you're doing that and you go and dig a hole, is there not a chance you could get a piece of sod, for example, with loads of holes in it, but the worms already moved because you were starting to put your fork in or... Yes, that's true. Yes, so the deep burrowing worms, uh, the hand sorting method can undercount them, but that's why the threshold for finding them uh, for the amber rating is only four out of ten. And there are other things you can use. As you said, the worms are coming out and feeding on the soil surface, and they make middens directly over that burrow. So if you'd have looked, you'd have found a midden. So you can look for those signs, and that will tell you you've got deep burrowing earthworms. So um, I would strongly encourage you just sort of looking around the environment. When I first started my project, and I was looking at worm populations, I still do it now. I go out in the middle of the night with a torch just to go and corroborate my findings, because you can count them. And a, a red light works better, um, like a, a red flashlight, because they're less sensitive to red light. Than, yeah. They do, yeah, really fast. <laughs> oh, oh, hi. Um, do you know it's any research going on about how vermicomposting is being integrated? Oh, um, vermiculture, how vermiculture is being integrated into agriculture and how we can start utilising that as an organic fertiliser. Uh, it's a good comment. So I haven't ever researched it. So vermicomposting is with compost worms, which don't uh, exist in arable fields. And... Um, all I can say is it, it is possible. There was a lot of research done in the 80s, certainly, about getting that done because there are benefits to plant productivity through uh, the plant hormones that, that the worms are producing. Um, but I guess what I was really trying to encourage people to do was take that look at soil health and um, by looking at their, their fields and then knowing where to go through from that. So worms certainly play a number of roles, and particularly in waste cycling. It would be great to see them you know, even the ones you don't get in arable fields being used to support composting and things, yep. Ah. Just sorry, Tony, there's, there's one at the back. I'm just going to go to him first. Cause can you put your hand up again? I noticed in your um, research that there, you did a, com a comparison between conventional and organic, and actually organic came out worse in some cases, especially aggregation um, within the horticulture. Was that, was that, did I see that right? Uh, that's what the results show, but yeah. I'd just like to say there were very few samples we okay. took. You know, there yeah. were only five samples. I wouldn't be confident that that mm, would be a right. trend. Horticulture in general yeah. would be uh, linked to intensive tillage, which is why you see mm. that. So it's not, it's not an organic versus conventional yeah. thing. It's just down for tillage. Because I think within organics, as organic producer, it is an elephant in the white room tillage, really. It's the most destructive thing we can do, and it's um, common practice, so... Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, are, anybody else? Does Tony? Just, just a quickie. How, how far do they travel and yep. what do they do with slug pellets? Good questions. So in terms of how far they travel, the deep burrowing earthworm can move about 10 metres a year. Um, so if you've reduced their populations enough, you're going to be relying on them coming in from the edges. So it can take quite a long time to repopulate. Uh, repopulate fields but on average it's about 10 meters a year ingressing back into the field and in terms of slug pellets um, earthworms particularly the deep burrowing worm that one that comes out at night you see on the soil surface that will can forage for slug pellets and it can bring about two to three slug pellets per hour back into its burrow so often you think you're getting lots of uh, lots of slug killed but unfortunately that will be the deep burrowing earthworm doing foraging activities and sometimes some research showed that change, changing the shape of the slug pellet could reduce the interaction with earthworms um, so that's one way forwards. Oh, so I'm sorry. So the research has shown uh, with aldehyde and the other one, um, ferric phosphate, that there's no significant effect on feeding behaviour with metaldehyde. But there may be a slight e effect on behaviours with the ferric phosphate, not linked to the ferric, but linked to the collator that's used in it. But it's, it's not a lethal effect. It just seemed to change their feeding behaviour, which was research that was done um, in the US. 
Um, the French pasture researcher, Voisin, measured 47 tons of earthworm casts per hectare per year. Mm -hmm. um, what are we doing here in, in UK? And what effect does the passage of the earth in the earthworm do to the availability of nutrients? It's great questions. So, um, yes, so the more earthworms you have, particularly those topsoil worms, which are the horizontal burrowers, uh, that will play a key role in the many tons of earthworm casts through soils um, per hectare. And the role that well, what earthworms do is they increase the availability of nutrients to plants, so particularly nitrogen and phosphorus are what earthworms are, are linked, to, um, linked to doing. And that was the main reason or the main mechanism linked to worms improving plant productivity was through uh, mobilising nitrogen and phosphorus. And it's equated approximately to around uh, 30 kilograms of N per hectare, like a sizable worm population. So it's not, you know, it won't replace bag fertilizer, don't get me wrong, but it could make a contribution there um, for more nutrient use efficiency. A few years ago, there was, a, uh, there was, there was sort of stories around alien worms and, mm -hmm. and worms coming in from abroad, yeah. threatening our populations. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a real uh, or imagined? So yes, that, that's a great question. There's the New Zealand flatworm, which has been found in Western Scotland and Ireland, and it predates on the deep burrowing earthworms, the anisic earthworm. But what the research has shown, and it's um, some really good ecologist worm researchers up there uh, working with farmers to map where they go, and they haven't found they travel south particularly. They like those cold, wet soils of Ireland and western Scotland, so they haven't moved down south and caused us problems. But it's something that's certainly worth monitoring, and there is um, an opal monitoring scheme also for flatworms. Uh, so keep an eye out, but we don't expect them to live in our warmer, drier soils down here. I think we've got time for another question, if anybody else wants to ask one. Yeah, you were saying about the, you didn't have many pastures on your test, but they didn't yes. show up that impressively, which is not what you'd expect. Is, is the wormers that people use on their cattle and sheep something to do with the problem, or? I think it was, I mean, the method I set up uh, was very much for arable fields, because sorting through the pasture takes a very long time with all the root mass. And in those situations, you probably would want to use a vermifuge as well, like a mustard, just to get the, because it takes so long to dig it out, you're going to lose a lot more worms burrowing and escaping. But also, a lot of the land people were saying to me that they had tested in those conditions was land they'd set aside because it wasn't very productive. So I think, it, because it wasn't the most productive land that was being tested, I think that may have a, a bit of a factor there. And the one thing with pasture very much is to check is pH, and that often gets forgotten. So sometimes things get more acidic over time, which reduces worm population. So it's something to you know, keep a close eye on um, in terms of measurements as well. Anybody else? There's still time for one more, because that was quite quick. Hi. <coughs> you just mentioned um, soil pH. Mm -hmm. I've heard in the past that um, uh, worms can uh, can lead or can process lime and act as a, a lime distributor in fields to reduce the pH level. Is that is that right? Is that something that does happen? Uh, worms can certainly distribute lots of things. If you put compost on the surface, you can see it bringing it down into its burrows, particularly those deep burrowing worms at night. So they do play a key role in mixing the soil and mixing anything that's on the surface um, in. And also the topsoil worms that just eat their way and make those horizontal burrows, their key role is aggregating and mixing the soil. So they do play an important role um, in mixing soil bits together. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Jackie. Can we have a round of applause for Jackie?